Okay, Sergeant, can you please start your recordings? Computer recording is up. Floor recording rolling. Sergeant Biondo, you begin. You may begin with your opening statement. Thank, thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council's preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on Small Business. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Joni. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote budget and legislative hearings. My name is Council Member Mark Jonai, and I am the chair of the Council's Committee on Small Business. Today, we'll be hearing from the Department of Small Business Service on their fiscal 2022 preliminary budget, which totals $152.8 million. The administration prepared the preliminary financial plan in the midst of the worldwide pandemic. As the coronavirus disease or COVID-19 has ravaged our healthcare system and our economy, small businesses throughout the city have faced uncertainty as to their ability to endure through the pandemic. Both federal and city programs and funds have been established to assist small businesses. As such, this preliminary plan introduces an estimate of the city spending related to its response to the recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. SBS launched six loan and grant programs in response to the pandemic. The NYC Business Continuity Loan Fund, New York City Employee Retention Grant Program, the New York City LMI Storefront Loan, the Interest Rate Reduction Grant, the Strategic Impact COVID-19 Commercial District Support Grant, and the NYC Small Business Emergency Grant Program. I want to hear from the agency how it plans to ensure that there is an equitable distribution of funds among the small businesses in all five boroughs and in all council districts. Additionally, SBS has started an initiative called Fair Share NYC, which is a campaign to help New York City businesses take full advantage of the opportunity to receive federal funds. I hope you can tell us about the services that this agency is providing through the initiative to assist New York City small businesses. I strongly believe, as I know the commissioner does, that small businesses are central to the health of New York City's local economy and deserve and need much more assistance to get them back on their feet. The Council has passed numerous pieces of legislation in the past year to assist commercial tenants, restaurants, and other small businesses. Hence, I'm very disappointed that the agency did not include the Commercial Lease Assistance Program in its preliminary budget. This program is crucial for our businesses during, these, during this economic crisis. At the same time, I'm proud of the work of this committee, which has passed numerous essential pieces of legislation since the start of the pandemic. One of the most important pieces of legislation we voted through was Local Law 55 of 2020, which temporarily suspended the enforcement of personal guarantee provisions in commercial leases of small businesses. The committee extended Local Law 55 to March 31st through a passage of Local Law 98 of 2020. And the pre-considered introduction we're hearing today will further extend these necessary protections through June 31st of 2021. As far as SBS's preliminary budget, I want to know what the agency's long-term plan is in assisting small businesses 
that have been a victim of this pandemic, with the exception of the Strategic Impact COVID-19 Commercial District Support Grant, almost all of the funding available to businesses are through federal funding and private contributions. The administration can't claim that small businesses and jobs are the backbone of our city while disinvesting and starving them of aid and resources at the very time that they need the most. Businesses and jobs are disappearing and the administration's most significant lifeline is a loan program that forces small business owners to put their personal assets like their home on the line as collateral. It's hypocritical that this administration supported removing personal guarantee provisions in commercial leases to private property owners and then boasts about the city aid through loans with personal guarantees. Now that we know that our city and state will receive more federal assistance and we can no longer or back on there, we're waiting for Washington to act excuse. Exactly what will the administration offer in direct programs that they were not able to do so last year? And I hope that means more grants and not interest bearing loans with personal guarantees. We also want to learn about the specific measures SBS is taking to assist and guide the city's small businesses through the pandemic and how it is tracking or monitoring the impact of the virus on small business and industries. It is the council's responsibility to ensure that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to New Yorkers. Hence, as the chair of small business committee, I will continue to push for accountability and accuracy and ensure that the budget reflects the needs and interests of the city. This hearing is a vital part of this process, and I expect that SBS will be responsive to the questions and concerns of the council members. I look forward to an active engagement with the administration over the next few months to ensure that the fiscal 2022 adopted budget meets the goals that council has set out. Additionally, I want to remind this administration that it is my understanding two thirds of the 90 plus billion dollar budget comes from New York City taxpayers, and that a major contributor of the 60 billion plus dollars of tax revenue comes from small business operators. New York City small business operators have helped build this city and have invested in the future of our city in time. In fact, many would say it's even long overdue for New York City to invest in the very small businesses and their very existence. With that being said, I wanna thank Commissioner Doris for testifying today. I'd like to thank SBS staff who have cons consistently been responsive to our many requests would not be able to analyze the city's budget in such detail without your cooperation. So thank you. I would also like to thank both my staff and the staff of the finance division for their help in preparing for this remote hearing. With that, I'd like to acknowledge that we have a special guest today. We have the public advocate, Jamani Williams, who's going to deliver an opening statement. Public advocate. Uh, thank you so much, Chair John. I uh, much appreciated. Uh, thank you to uh, the commissioner uh, as well for being here. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams. I'm the public advocate for the city of New York, uh, and I'm thankful to have an opportunity to give a statement today, this morning. Uh, at this time, actually, this afternoon. Uh, at this time last year, New York City shut down all activities because of COVID-19. We still saw high infection rates and death rates, particularly in communities of more color, despite limiting the virus's spread. The sudden closures also meant businesses needed to close with no knowledge of when to reopen. Clearly federal assistance would have been needed as businesses wait for the pandemic to pass. We could have and should have incentivized people to stay closed. One year after 
the need among small businesses is as great, perhaps greater than last year. Numerous small businesses across the city have permanently closed and workers have lost their jobs in a fragile economy. Loss of income can have serious impacts for communities across the city. That is why a relief plan is needed for the city's recovery. The administration's proposed preliminary budget for the Department of Small Business Services for fiscal year 2022 was $103.9 million. This is down 32.3 million or 31% from the current fiscal year. I understand that the city is making tough decisions because of the sudden budget shortfalls resulting from COVID-19. The pandemic and the resulting economic crisis has upended municipal budgets across the country. Yet I'm concerned about the budget's priorities and lack thereof. For example, the absence of funding for Workforce One career centers that provide job placement assistance and skill training referrals. By the end of December 2020, the New York City's unemployment rate was 11%. The psychological toll of unemployment can be devastating, particularly for people of more color who have disproportionately lost jobs. People deserve not only a chance at employment, but also boost. I'm also concerned about the lack of funding to enforce equal employment opportunity compliance and workforce diversity requirements. Diversity at workplace has an issue, was an issue before the pandemic, and it may have been amplified because of it. We need to make sure employers are following EEO, EEO compliance as well as, for example, ensuring opportunities for people with disabilities. Frankly, we must exhaust all of our efforts to help small businesses. That requires creative thinking on our part, and I commend the commissioner for talking with businesses across the city in the past year to find solutions. We need to be both transparent and proactive to ensure small businesses and workers get the help they need. Earlier this month, my office released a renewed deal for New York City. In it, I offered solutions to help the city's business and workers. For example, the city should suspend or severely cap commercial rent over tax breaks and deferments and minimize cuts to SBS. Moreover, tax incentives usually offered for wealthy corporations should instead go toward our small businesses who can and do produce a significant amount of jobs in our community. One of my bills, intro number 1990, is another great example of what we can do. The bill provides interest-free loans to small businesses, nonprofits, and freelance workers ineligible for state assistance. The commissioner would determine the specific details of the program from the application process to potential forgiveness. The legislation is one of several solutions that is needed for one of the worst economic crises in the city's history. Finally, minority and women-owned businesses must also be prioritized in the city's recovery. The proposed executive budget slightly increases economic and financial opportunities for MWBEs from $8.31 million in fiscal year 2020 to $8.38 million in fiscal year 2022. Well, of course, you can welcome it. However, we need to ensure MWBEs can easily access our city's contracts. That increase is almost negligible. The contracting process can be opaque and confusing for MWBEs. There's no time to waste. Uh, there's no time to wait. These firms face numerous challenges that can be corrected through government intervention. We need to level the playing field for historically disadvantaged firms. In general, the administration must ensure that the executive budget reflects the priorities of New Yorkers, especially with the influx of money we're expecting from uh, the federal government. I hope we uh, change some of these numbers. It's not lost on me that uh, we are decreasing the amount of, of many agencies budget while we are increasing uh, the NYPDs and that shouldn't be lost on anyone and the message that may send. Uh, having been a former uh, business owner, didn't quite make it like some others, but I can only imagine what it would have been like uh, trying to make it during pandemic. I worry that uh, if we don't reflect the priorities properly uh, we can anticipate discussion and potential budget changes as negotiation takes place. Um, I hope that happens. Thanks to you, the chair. And I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you, public advocate. We're grateful uh, to you for making time to participate in not only this hearing, but the entire budget process. And I'm looking forward to working with you as we address uh, the injustice that our small businesses are facing. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Rivera and Rosenthal. And now I ask uh, Council Member Rivera, the prime sponsor of the legislation we're hearing on today, to deliver her opening statement. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Jonai, for the opportunity to speak briefly on my pre considered bill that we're hearing today to extend for a second time the prohibition of enforcement of personal liability provisions 
in commercial leases or rental agreements involving a COVID-19 impacted tenant. It's been 10 months since we first passed this emergency legislation. I don't think any of us could have foreseen last year that we'd still be in this situation in March, 2021. This disaster has profoundly changed our cityscape with a nearly 40% decrease in the number of small businesses operating citywide in the last year, according to Harvard University. And 12% of all businesses in Lower Manhattan, which includes my district, have closed, according to the Downtown Alliance. I, like many of my colleagues, have been fighting every single day to keep our small business community alive. I introduced legislation to create the city's open streets program and supported legislation to establish the open restaurants program. I fought with my council colleagues here to restore funding to the city's commercial lease assistance program in last year's budget. And we've worked with local community organizations to assist businesses in securing emergency grants and loans. But of all of our work in the council, this personal liability legislation is the effort I continue to hear the most about from small business owners. Many who reached out over the past month worried they would have to shut down their business without the extension. The continued suspension of personal liability clauses and commercial leases will ensure that countless businesses teetering on the edge can continue to focus on paying workers and supporting their communities without the threat of landlords going after their personal life savings and assets if they do have to shut down. We fought and won in court to protect this law, and I'm proud that we are continuing with this legislative effort once again. I hope that by the new expiration date of June 30th, when all New Yorkers will be able to access COVID vaccines and our open streets and, and that restaurants will be fully open in the warmer summer weather, we'll see a revitalization and celebration of our neighborhood businesses that make New York City the envy of the world. I urge the administration and my colleagues to support this bill when it comes up for a vote later this month and to continue supporting small businesses with the innovative policy that they deserve. Thank you to all of my colleagues, to the administration for being here, and of course, to Chair Jonai for allowing me this moment to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Let's hope the administration is listening and they too will adopt the uh, waiver of personal liability uh, when it comes to the loans that are being offered to our small businesses that are in desperate need of any help that they can get. It's a bit ironic that the uh, here we are removing the personal liability that's associated with leases, but adding a personal liability when it comes to getting aid from the city. So thank you, council member. I want to turn it over to our moderator, committee council, Stephanie Jones, who will go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Jonai. I am Stephanie Jones, council to the committee on small business, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will be inviting testimony from the Department of Small Business Services, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. It's, it's not we will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Janelle Doris, Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services. We will also be joined for questions by the following representatives from SBS. Jackie Mallon, First Deputy Commissioner. Dinah Shaw Gross, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Economic and Financial Opportunity. Andrew Schwartz, Deputy Commissioner for Legal and Regulatory Affairs. Blaze Backer, Deputy Commissioner for the Neighborhood Development Division. And Lucinda Glover, Deputy Commissioner for the Workforce Development Division. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Panelists, please turn on your videos if you have not yet done so. OK, 
Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Doris. I do. First Deputy Commissioner Mallon. I do. Deputy Commissioner Gross. I do. Deputy Commissioner Schwartz. I do. Deputy Commissioner Backer. I do. Deputy Commissioner Glover. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Doris to present his testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Jonai, members of the Committee on Small Business and our public advocate, Jamani Williams. My name is John L. Doris and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I am joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon and members of my senior leadership team. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting New Yorkers to good jobs, creating stronger businesses, and building thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Furthermore, innovation, adaptability, and collaboration underpinned by uh, equity are the guiding principles that ground all our work. With our programs uh, that include the New York City Small Business Solution Centers, the Workforce One Career Centers and Services, administering the MWBE program, providing financial assistance and overseeing the largest network of bids in the country. Our goal is to provide high quality service and create opportunity for New Yorkers. SBS fiscal year 22 preliminary budget is $152.8 million with a headcount of 298 employees. The, primary, the preliminary budget includes pass-through funding that is not spent or managed by SBS as we serve as a conduit for the funding for other city entities. Of the 152.8 million, 40.7% or 62.2 million is pass-through funding, which includes 26.3 million for the New York City Economic Development Corporation, 20.8 million, for New York City and Company, and 15.1 million for Governor's Island. The remaining 90.6 million or 59.3% of the fiscal year 22 preliminary budget is allocated for SBS programs. Just over a year ago, our work and the lives of our clients were upended in a way we could have never imagined. New York City was forced to shut down to come back this, this uh, ensuing and surging pandemic and prioritize the health and safety of New Yorkers. The economic crisis that followed has been nothing short of devastating for small businesses, especially to our immigrant and minority owned businesses, job seekers and neighborhoods. From the moment of the shutdown, the city acted swiftly to support small businesses. At SBS, our agency has worked tirelessly to blunt the severe damage from this prolonged health and economic crisis and ensure an equitable recovery. SBS employees have played a vital role in the, in the response effort, working nonstop since the start of this pandemic. I am incredibly proud of these dedicated and committed public servants who are at the front lines, helping to bring our city back, our, uh, supporting our small businesses, workers, and communities. In the last year, we have launched over two dozen new programs and initiatives, delivered 134,000 services to small businesses, supported over 76,000 individuals, and connected New York New Yorkers to more than 14,500 jobs. We have connected more than 5,000 small businesses to over 135 million in local, state, federal, and philanthropic funding. Our small businesses uh, hotline. Uh, has fielded over 55,000 individual calls, and we have hosted over 355 webinars serving nearly 50,000 attendees and provided over 750 mentorship programs to New York City business owners. We have completed 335 virtual consultations and hit the streets going door to door, meeting businesses where they are by walking in over 80 commercial corridors around the city. Additionally, we have connected with over 100 business advocacy groups to support outreach and get feedback on our programs and community needs. Adapting to the new circumstance and creating new programs has been a critical part of our response. The Open Restaurants Program 
was an early lifeline for businesses and has enrolled more than 11,000 establishments and saving about 90,000 jobs citywide. Building on this program, the city launched the Open Storefronts program, which opened the streets to other ground floor businesses to take advantage of must needed outdoor space. We also expanded our no cost compliance consultation services to help businesses open safely, avoid penalties and created plain language reopening resource guides for each industry. We were the first city in the country to provide financial assistance to businesses and launched the employee retention grant and the small business continuity loan fund given relief when federal and state programs were not available for the stores that were impacted by looting or vandalism over the summer we launched a small business emergency grant program to mitigate damages and in november when washington had not yet produced a second round of much needed relief we launched an nyc lmi storefront loan and interest rate reduction grant which were designed for small businesses in low to moderate income LMI neighborhoods largely left out of the first round of federal aid. Our commercial revitalization grants, including the new strategic impact COVID-19 commercial district support grant, were designed to help execute local COVID-19 recovery support for small businesses and strengthen New York City commercial corridors. To date, these programs have put 61 million in the pockets of 4,500 small businesses and allocated another 4.4 million to 50 small business supporting organizations in 66 communities to help small businesses across access billions in federal relief. Our fair share program provides direct assistance to businesses and offers free resources, one-on-one -on -one technical application assistance and help connect uh, PPP lend to connect to uh, PPP lenders. Today, we have helped over 300 businesses access 17.5 million in PPP funds. And for those businesses, 73% reported of being uh, minority owned and 70% uh, are located in the other outer boroughs. To support the creative industry, we launched Curtains Up NYC, a program that offers uh, help to NYC businesses and nonprofits connected to live performance to apply for the federal shuttered venue operations grant. We also invested in three new mentorship programs targeted in communities identified by the city's task force on racial inclusion and equity, small business mentors, uh, NYC, BNYC mentors, and MWBE mentors provided industry experts as guides for the current and aspiring entrepreneurs seeking to start and grow a business during difficult times. These programs are expected to serve at least 1,500 businesses in 2021. To help small business owners bridge the digital divide and take their businesses online, we launched training for your employees and no cost training on cloud software programs uh, with live instruction in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. These, tar these courses target tree uh, neighborhoods uh, with a focus on micro businesses. And to date, 72% of attendees are minority owned and 67% are women owned. We also launched our Shop Your City uh, advertising and social media campaign to drive more customers to shop locally. It includes ways New Yorkers can support minority-owned businesses, some of the hardest hit during the pandemic. Lower middle-income New Yorkers have been hit the hardest during the pandemic, with many losing their jobs. Our Workforce One centers are here to help and have assisted more than 76,200 individuals and worked with over 1,000 businesses. And we have connected New Yorkers to more than 14,500 jobs, an average uh, salary of uh, $17.40 per hour. We continue 13 occupational training programs promote, uh, remotely in the sectors of tech, healthcare, media, and industry, from which we hired, hired graduates went on to make an average salary of $60,000 annually, creating a real path to family sustaining wages for these New Yorkers to prepare New Yorkers with the skills to pursue an in-demand career in the industrial, media, and tech sectors, we launched Career Discovery NYC, a centralized resource to assist New Yorkers with career exploration and training. We have also continued to offer the construction site safety training online and show issuing over 2,700 site safety training cards to date and with courses uh, available in English, Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, Polish, and Russian. MWBs have also been key uh, focus for us during the pandemic. We create even greater equity of opportunity in public procurement and offer expanded opportunities to MWBEs 
Uh, in July 2020, the mayor signed Executive Order 59, directed all city agencies to maximize the use of the MWBE 500,000 discretionary method by procuring uh, goods, services, and construction from MWBEs and of requiring agencies to get at least one quote from MWBEs for awarding a COVID-19 response contract and tracking of awards and payments uh, by the office of MWBE shows that 536 MWBEs have received 910 million in emergency contract work and payments from mayoral and non-mayoral agencies since March of 2020. Supporting women and black entrepreneurs is vital to the success recovery. During the pandemic, we NYC has continued to provide services through its 10 research-based programs designed to benefit women with education, legal assistance, mentorship, networking opportunities, and access to capital. The NYC has pushed Black entrepreneurs to the forefront of the city's equity, innovation, and agenda, and is creating pathways for generational wealth. Through the support of the council, our Chamber on the Go initiatives allows us to have our trained business specialists canvas commercial uh, corridors and connect with business owners. They have already successfully reached more than 18,000 businesses directly. And the council supported worker cooperative program has already helped 196 worker cooperatives and has led to the creation of 889 new jobs. SBS created a small business recovery plan designed to jumpstart the economy in the short term while laying the groundwork for sustainable small business recovery in the long term. This small business recovery plan developed in collaboration with business and leaders, industry associations, and city government partners was based on four strategies to ensure an equitable citywide economic recovery. Support businesses to innovation to increase revenue, equip entrepreneurs to adapt and lower operating costs, foster close collaboration with businesses to cut red tape, and promote equitable economic growth and support diverse businesses of the future. With our business recovery plan in full swing, the massive vaccination effort underway, and the passing of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, New York small, business, small businesses can finally see a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. As New York City starts to turn the corner, showing signs of an economic recovery, SBS continues to focus on making significant and sufficient capital available for small businesses to recover and survive and providing relief for businesses operating expenses to avert more small business closures. To support these efforts at this year's State of the City, the mayor announced several initiatives that will drive economic recovery amount small businesses, including a hundred million loan fund and a 50 million rental assistance program in the form of a tax credit. And with an additional 7.25 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program, an additional 15 billion for the Targeted Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and 28.6 billion restaurant revitalization fund included in the American Rescue Act Plan Act, SBS plans to provide technical assistance to help small businesses and restaurant operators prepare and access this much needed federal aid. SBS will activate uh, our fair share in the NYC in the same way we did for small business owners accessing PPP and the Curtains Up NYC program for performance uh, venues. We will also continue to work with partner agencies and city council to make New York City one of the easiest places in the country to open and reopen a business by cutting fines and red tape to help small business owners recover and thrive. The key component to the city's recovery is continue to connect New Yorkers to good jobs. The recently announced Vaccine for All Corps, which will employ 2,000 New Yorkers for our, from neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID, will be sourced, uh, workers will be sourced through the SBS Workforce One centers. And lastly, we will continue to work with the city's 76 bids, five chambers, community groups, and, and sector council re representatives to ensure the city's business districts, retail quarters, and neighborhoods are clean and safe, welcoming businesses and customers alike. In conclusion, I am incredibly proud of the work my team at SBS has done to serve businesses, neighborhoods, and job seekers during fiscal year 21 and throughout the pandemic. While we know that there are challenges ahead, we are confident that our economic recovery plans present a roadmap that will ensure a sustainable and equitable recovery for New York City, small businesses, workers, and neighborhoods. I look forward 
to the council's continued partnership as we work together to aid in New York City's recovery from COVID-19. Finally, I wanna share my support for the extension of Local Law 55 of 2020, which extends temporary personal uh, guarantee protection uh, provisions for, for commercial tenants impacted by COVID-19. The law all has allowed small business owners to plan and make decisions without fear of additional losses. Thank you for the opportunity to present today, and I'm happy to take the questions you may have. Thank you so much, Commissioner Doris. Um, can you please reiterate those numbers again in the programs um, that you uh, went through in your testimony? Uh, the 100 million, the 50 million, and so on and so forth. Can you explain a little bit about those programs? Sure. Uh, in the mayor's state of the city, uh, the mayor uh, did mention that uh, as federal uh, assistance comes in and federal stimulus comes in, um, we will launched a $100 million loan fund uh, for small businesses and a $50 million uh, tax uh, credit program uh, for small businesses as well. Um, and that is currently uh, in Albany, it was presented in the one house bill in the assembly and it was also, I believe, introduced uh, in the Senate, state Senate. Uh, so those programs are currently ongoing. Um, we of course are evaluating as you can imagine uh, the impact of the stimulus that is coming to New York City, not fully there yet. Uh, we are speaking uh, with OMB and others around that, uh, but we will have probably more to say uh, at a later date on exactly how that program will be implemented. I'm looking forward to hearing more about those programs. Uh, this is a, uh, a dire time for our small businesses, commissioners. You and I have discussed so many on numerous occasions and over the last year, of what we need to do and how we fall in short of coming to the aid of our small businesses. And I hope that uh, some of those programs are 0% interest loans versus loans with interest rates that also require personal guarantees. I keep bringing that up because I just can't imagine how we continue to provide or claim to provide aid that is risking um, the homes and any other investment our small businesses may still have. Um, but thank you, Commissioner. I look forward to continuing that. Can you please help me understand, Commissioner Doris, why in the preliminary budget, the Commercial Lease Assistance Program, which is a vital program that small businesses uh, need the most, why is the funding for this program not included in the preliminary budget? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member, for, for that question. Um, look, the CLA program, as you know, is one of... Uh, uh, my favorite programs and vital program to this agency. Um, you know, the program will be included in our budget uh, going forward. Um, and so uh, we are very excited about that. You know, last year, uh, while it wasn't included uh, initially, it was uh, put into the budget and we actually increased the expenditures for that program by $300,000. Uh, so, um, you know, we can say today that, um, you know, they will be included also in our budget. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you feel it's going to be included in the final budget, um, but you, you haven't answered why it wasn't included in the preliminary budget. If you're such a supporter of it, the administration believes the need is there more than ever before, uh, and we rant and rave about uh, the advantages of the program. Why wouldn't it be in the preliminary budget? Yeah, no, you 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 know, look, we're going through the budget process as you could imagine. Uh, now, um, also with, uh, uh, you know, not fully having uh, the uh, forecast that we have now with incoming assistance to the city. Uh, but look, we always intended to have this program uh, in, the, in our budget. It's, it's going to be in our budget. We have the commitment. The mayor actually committed at his testimony in Albany uh, as well. I mean, so we, you know, we're uh, just going through this budget process, uh, it will be in there as it is now. Thank you, Commissioner. I think we could all agree now, based on uh, the input of the marketplace, that um, we expect a third of our businesses not to reopen. Is that an acceptable number to you, Commissioner? That will not survive uh, the pandemic? That is what we've heard. Um, you know, some in the t a third, up to a third, that's generally. Uh, what we're hearing. Um, 
but we're also uh, seeing uh, that number fluctuates. Um, you know, it depends on the industry, depends on where, but certainly we've heard that as well. It would be devastating for the city's economy in the future if we lost any, if we lost a third or anything close to a third of our small businesses. Um, and I continue to beat the drums on we must do more. We must do more to ensure that these businesses survive so that they can thrive later. The smartest investment that we can do now into this economy that is so questionable in the future of our city is by helping small businesses remain open. It would, be, it would yield an instant return on any investment that we make. Hope that we continue this dialogue. I hope the administration truly commits itself, not only in words, but in true dollars, into helping these businesses survive. Small businesses will need the assistance beyond fiscal 2021. Many of the experts are predicting our recovery to go well into 2024, and if not into 2025. What are we doing to plan long term strategically? to help meet the needs of these small businesses. Well, thank you so much, Chair, for that. Look, I, I, we agree 100% that um, you know, our, our program uh, for small businesses uh, need to have a long-term strategy, and that's baked into what we are doing. Um, we presented the four points in my testimony, you know, increase in revenue um, by, by helping support innovation for small businesses. That's both long-term and short-term. Uh, we've also talked about having businesses the ability to adapt lower operating costs, but one of the real uh, long-term strategies, and I think we've been working uh, closely with you on this as well, is really making New York City the easiest uh, uh, place to actually open a business. And that means we've got to cut red tape. We have to make sure that the fines and fees are also uh, uh, you know, adjusted, uh, more cure periods, et cetera, all, all the, uh, the items that, that you've discussed, uh, we've got to create an environment and continue to create an environment here in the city uh, that is conducive for business growth. And then ultimately, uh, we're really focused about what, a, what an equitable future looks like, really supporting uh, diverse entrepreneurs, um, which is uh, critical. Um, you know, over 50% of New York City businesses are immigrant owned. Uh, when we think about that and who they are and how we're supporting them, that's a long-term strategy. Um, also, uh, beyond that, uh, making it easy for small businesses to really take from go from ideation um, into to actual end product, and that, um, for instance, we're we're at uh, we announced the uh, the accelerator that's going to be at the Brooklyn Navy Yard for for uh, Black entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs of color. Uh, when you think about what that means, is that we're creating um, an atmosphere where those businesses can actually get an idea and then take that idea and bring it to that product to market and helping facilitate that. And also lastly, I'll say is really helping uh, small businesses adapt in the way of technology. And um, we have uh, certainly more to come on that, but certainly that is part of our focus. And so uh, making them more adaptable, making sure that these small businesses, uh, we're helping them lower operating costs and then really changing the regulatory environment for the city to make it easier for these businesses to actually open and then thinking about diverse businesses and how we engage them and how we bring an idea to market. All those things are a part of our long-term strategy uh, to help this uh, economy come back and our small businesses come back. Thank you, Commissioner. Again, I, uh, I, it's great that we're thinking of how we can streamline the opening of businesses, um, get rid of the bureaucracy and red tape. But my focus, and I think our immediate focus should be on how we help existing businesses stay open. So if we can cut any red tape and bureaucracy, uh, that should be our focus. These are the Absolutely. businesses that have built the city. So I welcome any new business for the city of New York. But my priority is to those that have built and invested in this city, that they stay open. Absolutely. Outlining uh, all of those uh, programs and ideas that you just uh, went through, you believe SBS's expense budget is large enough to meet and support those small business programs that you just referred to? 
Well, Mr. Chair, as any good commissioner, I would say to you that we welcome additional resources uh, uh, if we can get it. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, whatever our budget may be as it is now, uh, we have done all uh, those programs that I discussed in my uh, opening, and we have provided resources both to uh, uh, workers, neighborhoods, our bids, our chambers, others, uh, and also our small businesses um, with the resources that we have. So we certainly are, are very excited about the new resources that are going to be coming to us through the programmatic uh, uh, announcements the mayor made at the State of the City and I mentioned. Uh, but certainly uh, we will make sure that we maximize the use of our budget that we have. Thank you. So I give you a suggestion, uh, as you obviously, uh, as you eloquently put, that any commissioner would seek more dollars for their uh, for the programs that uh, they need and for the staff and for the agency that they're responsible to. His name is Mayor Bill de Blasio. I encourage that he give more of the budget uh, to small business services, especially now that Washington has done its part. It's up to this administration to do its part. And that is to make sure that your department, your agencies, fully funded to make those programs and initiatives a reality and to make sure that equitably all five boroughs in all council districts are afforded the same opportunities through loans and grants. And I focus more on the outer boroughs than Manhattan. And we've, we've gone through this so many times that uh, I, I don't want to be the that horse. If Manhattan is the engine, the fuel comes from the outer boroughs. And the outer boroughs need more. It was quite disappointing during our last hearing when we found out that the three, the three council districts that received the bulk of the aid were in Manhattan. And the three professions were doctors, lawyers, and dentists. That is not the small businesses that we all envision, the mom and pops that need aid on these economic uh, crises that we're all facing. Have all of the loans and grants been dispersed already? If not, do you know what's left in each program? Uh, let me, two, yes, let me uh, give a point of clarification on, on certainly earlier on, as you mentioned, the continuity loan fund um, and the uh, we did talk about that in terms of borough diversity, but uh, subsequent programs that we have launched um, have been significantly uh, different, as you as you uh, as we mentioned as well. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, the outer boroughs know, and everyone, all small businesses across the city know that we do have a five borough strategy that we've implemented uh, since uh, certainly. Um, the time uh, from the last, the previous first loan and grant program. And so um, I would say that the, uh, the, the uh, strategic impact grants, sorry, are, are still open. Our LMI storefront uh, program, while it's closed to applications, uh, we're still processing uh, all the applications that were put into that program. Um, and so those, those programs and the interest rate reduction grant program is, all, is also open and active at this moment. You know the dollar amounts that are left in those three programs that have not been dispersed? Um, I can, let me ask the team here if everybody, if uh, someone can uh, pull that up uh, as we, we discuss today. In well, total, they, in total, it's around twenty-four million-ish for all three programs. Uh, yeah, Deputy? combined. That certainly uh, would go a long way in helping some of our small businesses, but certainly does not meet the needs of all of our small businesses. The two hundred thirty thousand plus businesses in the city of New York, um, Commissioner. Many of the businesses have told me that they've never even heard about any of these programs as recently as yesterday, and I believe um, we'll be hearing later on uh, from a small business owner that's going to testify today at this hearing, that they've never been able to get in touch with anyone, to hear about the programs, 
and then they did follow up, whether it be through SBS or any of the other small business uh, assistance groups out there, it all led to a dead end. That besides the applications that were submitted, she was never heard back. Um, and I'm sure this is the telling story of many of our small businesses that have chased leads, that have chased the opportunity to apply for a loan and grant and have not been able to do so or not heard feedback. Is this a concern for you? Uh, you know, I would say that absolutely, we want to make sure that small businesses know that um, customer service uh, is uh, very much a part of who we are here at SBS. And, and, and certainly if there's a small business who uh, have reached out and uh, were not able to uh, contact us, um, you know, that's, that's something that is dear and dear to me. And, and certainly we want to make sure that we help uh, that particular business. I would say though that uh, look, we launched our uh, hotline and over 55,000 uh, small businesses have called that hotline. Uh, I am at the mayor's uh, press conference many times and also reiterating that uh, to, to everyone. Uh, we also do direct outreach through the 100 organizations plus that I mentioned um, earlier in my testimony. Um, we are online. We do have uh, translation in, in particularly on our, our hotline of several hundred languages um, and uh, over, I think, 11 or so uh, translations in the, in the materials that we put out. Um, look, I, you know, and, and, and constant communication back with uh, our chambers, 76 bids representing 96,000 96, small businesses. Uh, but we're, we're not, I, I would not sit here and tell you that a particular uh, business somewhere in the city uh, may not uh, have had an opportunity to hear about this. So part of what we're doing is doubling down on those efforts. Um, and by doing that, that's where we launched our Shop Your City campaign uh, to let folks know uh, to shop locally, but also highlight our small businesses and the resources that we have. And bring really true, you know, bring some some illumination to the resources that the city have, and and certainly walk in the corridors like we've done with you and so many other of our, our council members to really let small businesses know uh, that there is help for them. Uh, but certainly, if a small business is uh, unable to or did not, or if there's some uh, issue, uh, we're happy to take that on and help and assist them uh, right away. We certainly would would do that. Thank you, Commissioner. SBS budget, there's a line item for contracts. Um, do you know what that dollar amount is? I don't have it in front of me. Uh, and have you gotten the answer? Oh, you got the answer on the 24 million. Do you know what that dollar amount is for outside contracts through your agency? Line item outside contracts. Uh, not consultants, sure. consultants and contracts that SBS engages throughout the year or predict, um, will have to engage with throughout the year. I know we have several uh, consultants and, uh, that help us with our MWBE program. We also have uh, for our, uh, our various programs that we do have in our business solution centers. I know our workforce uh, centers have uh, consultants. I'm not sure which line you, I'm sorry, but I don't know which line um, that you're talking about, but if happy to, see if I can. So the, the question I'm headed to says, commissioner. On these consultants and outside contractors mm -hmm. that SBS will be engaging, are they all from New York City or some or any of the consultants or contracts that you um, that you'll be working with outside of the five boroughs? I think the short answer would be that the the majority of who the folks we work with are folks from the city, but um, Jackie, do you have any additional uh, intel on that? Yeah, there are, there are um, a couple of, of um, uh, workforce providers, for example, who are not located or not headquartered here. They're all located here. They're all local people working on them, but just not, the business is headquartered in, in another city as an example, but you are right. The, ma the, the majority are, are, are city-based firms or MWBEs where possible. Thank, thank you, um, Deputy. I'm looking at the contract budget trend, um, and it looks like FY22 through Mary of the 152 million, 114 million are, con are contract 
budget line item. And whatever that number is, when you're saying a majority, it just doesn't make any sense to me that we can't find that expertise in a city of 8.6 million people at a time when businesses are closing and everyone is looking for, uh, for, for work and business. It actually should be unsettling to know that a dollar leaves New York City. And as you say, those, co those corporations or entities may have offices out of New York City and not in New York City. Just remember, every dollar that leaves the city doesn't come back to the city, whether it be through income tax or any other tax. And I would encourage you to start looking at those contracts in this upcoming budget and assuring New Yorkers that every dollar that is going to be contracted out will be a New York City entity which hires and employs New York City residents. And I don't know if you want to comment on that, Commissioner. Yeah, only again, I mean, that's a big number you mentioned. I just want to make sure that uh, I want to, I mean, with contract services, the EDC, NYC and company, Governor's Island, I mean, those are in Brooklyn Navy Yard. That's what we have at 62.2 million. And so that's the pass through component of our budget. If that's what we're talking about, that's all city entities. But certainly hear you on the, uh, uh, the importance and significance of uh, local contracting here. And certainly we, um, we support that. And, you know, certainly the majority of our contracts uh, that we have at the city uh, are local um, here at SBS. And, and, and majority that we contract with our, I think overwhelmingly majority over, I think 65%, 70% are MWBEs for this particular agency. So I, I'm not sure if that's the mix up there, but the contract services line that we have is EDC, that's the pass-through contracts that we have with uh, other city entities. So thank you for that explanation, uh, Commissioner. And the, the dollar not, I, I'm looking at the graph, it's 114,378,000. I'm sure that includes EDC. I'm hopeful that after this hearing that your uh, agency will be able to provide me a breakdown of those contracts. And, make, and even let's get a little deeper. Where mm -hmm. are those contracts going as far as the breakdown of a distribution for all five boroughs. So if this again is gonna be all Manhattan based, we'll have another issue. Uh, so I'd love to see the breakdown of that 114 million to see how many of those contracts are being afforded to entities and groups in New York City. And then let's look at them by borough. Let's determine if equitably all five boroughs are given an opportunity participate in this large dollar amount, especially during this time. Can I get a commitment from you on that? Well, we certainly can provide uh, the, the breakdown of where our contracts are and certainly uh, uh, sort of take out the EDC and Governor's Island Navy Yard components so that uh, it's, you can see that a little bit more clearly. Absolutely. Even including them in there, we can just decipher the numbers. I wouldn't be okay. uh, shell-shocked. Um, Stephanie, does any, uh, do any of the council members have questions for the commissioner? No, not at this time, Chair. Well, commissioner, I know as always you have a lot going on, but some of your staff will remain um, on doing this here and follow the testimony of those that have uh, signed up to testify that we can learn more from the public. And that's our responsibility. The more we hear, the more we learn, and the more we know what to do. So I want to thank you, commissioner your time and the work that uh, we've done together and the work ahead. Um, and I, I know that you're, you and I share the same passion for our small businesses. Um, and I know that we both have responsibilities and different paths on how we're going to get there. Um, but I'm looking forward to making sure that we do the most that we can to help our small businesses. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, because you're also all awesome. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. 
Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelists should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Paula Siegel to testify, followed by Kun Sang Keldon and Andrew Ritchie. Paula? Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, as you know, my name is Paula Siegel. I am speaking today as senior staff attorney at Take Root Justice. Um, Take Root works with grassroots groups, neighborhood organizations, and community coalitions to help make sure that people of color, immigrants, and other low-income residents who've built our city are not pushed out in the name of progress. Um, Take Root is also a member of United for Small Business NYC, USB NYC, a coalition of 15 organizations in New York City fighting to protect small business and non-residential tenants from the threat of displacement. It was as a response to USB NYC's advocacy a couple of years ago that the administration launched the commercial lease assistance program that I'll be speaking about in a little bit more detail. Um, Take Root Justice is also one of the providers on the, in the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, and we thank the council's support for that initiative. Um, as you know, Take Root and our partners, uh, Volunteers of Legal Service and Brooklyn Corporation A, provide direct legal representation to low-income small business owners via a contract with the Department of Small Business Services. Um, we have we were dismayed to see that in the preliminary budget, the amount for this program was once again reduced to zero. Um, since the inception of the program in 2018, CLA the CLA program has addressed over 1,200 legal matters, and just since March, my office, which has the smallest piece of the contract, has counseled over 100 small businesses negotiating with their landlords about rent and tenancy. In the midst of an ongoing pandemic that has thrust even greater economic strain on those least able to weather it, our clients are struggling to avert both personal and corporate bankruptcies. Several of them are here today to tell you directly about the impact access to legal services has had on their small and family businesses. The mayor's budget line say, stating zero echoed the disruption that the program had last year when in the June budget, the program was cut entirely. Mayor de Blasio saw fit to restore the program late last summer in response to the advocacy of council members here, ourselves, our community-based organization partners, and our small business clients. Uh, the preliminary budget suggested yet another such disruption might be in our future, and we as a city just can't afford it. We're glad to hear commitments from the, from the administration at this hearing and in recent weeks to restore the funding in the final budget so we can keep providing services without interruption but we really ask the committee to recommend renewing and expanding funding in the fiscal 22 budget and to push for a future where support for small businesses isn't subject to the whiplash of the budget process as we heard about today. We also urge the council to support the extension of personal guarantee restrictions for COVID impacted small businesses as introduced by council member Rivera. I will see the rest of my team. Thank you so much, Paula. I mean, that was a time to the second, by the way. Good for you. I was also disappointed, and I'm not sure why the emotional roller coaster, budget after budget, to take it out and to have all of the stakeholders that engage and spend the limited time and resources that we have to make sure that not only gets put back on, that it's not cut. I do not understand. I don't understand why this dog and pony show uh, continues year in and year out. But I agree with you and that's a service that um, I will be pushing for and so many of my colleagues understanding the good work that you do. So thank you, Paula. Thank you, council member. Thank you, Paula. Next, I will be calling Kun Sang Keldon, followed by Andrew Ridgey and then Andrea Bowen. Kun Sang? Time starts now. Hi, my name is Kunsung Keldon, um, and I'm from Docom. We're a small family-owned retail business um, 
in the East Village. Um, and we opened our store 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, like many small businesses across the city, we experienced our most difficult year ever uh, during the pandemic. Um, in the beginning, we experienced an 85% decrease in overall sales. And then starting from March, we were closed uh, for several months. Um, throughout the pandemic, however, our landlord demanded our full rent without any concessions. And we received countless emails, letters, harassing phone calls on a regular basis, um, struggling to pay that rent and handling the overall communications and negotiations with our landlord uh, was incredibly uh, stressful. Um, the amount that we owed our landlord by February 2021 was near to $100,000. Uh, for small businesses like us, um, you know, that amount is incredibly uh, stressful and catastrophic. And without the help of Paula at Take Root Justice, uh, we would not have been able to successfully negotiate a 50% reduction in that amount owed in addition to nine months of 2021 um, also being reduced. Um, so the support of Take Root as well as the Cooper Square Committee has been incredibly valuable to us um, as a small business. And, um, you know, we wouldn't have been able to navigate this uh, area, which is incredibly scary and, you know, having the support to navigate this uh, discussion and communication with our landlord in a way that feels uh, safe and secure during a time when, uh, you know, there's, we feel like we're constantly, um, you know, having to think about what to do in an emergency situation. And I think, um, you know, we really appreciate having that uh, kind of advising and uh, ongoing communication um, because it's not easy with just it being me and my father who's elderly having to negotiate safety and security during COVID times um, and then having to deal with a landlord who is not willing to listen and is really not willing to um, make any kind of concession. So to us, um, having this type of resource from the from an organization was uh, incredibly helpful. So um, I thank you very much for uh, inviting me to share my testimony. Um, and uh, yes, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Sung. And it's great to know that uh, Paula was able to help you as you negotiate or renegotiate. What, and the 50000 that you've now agreed to, were you able to pay it off? And have you applied for any loans or grants uh, through New York City or anywhere else to help you pay that? Unfortunately. Money? Yes, unfortunately, we have applied for small business grants in the past. Um, however, we were not able to receive anything. Um, and in the negotiation um, of that 50000 I mean, a little bit less, um, we were able to pay a chunk of it off because we had savings, but that wiped out all of our savings. And and in addition, we were we also had to resort to taking from our security deposit that we had given to the landlord. Um, but it near it took nearly a year in order to get to this point. Um, when we got in touch with Cooper Square Committee last November or December, um, at that point there had been no change in the in what they were offering, um, and it wasn't until uh, last December and up until maybe like about last month where we actually reached a point um, uh, in our agreement with them. So uh, yeah, so to answer your question, we were able to pay it off, but we had to resort to taking it out of our deposit. Thanks, Christine. As you heard the commissioner say that uh, open and through Paula, and uh, I'm sure Paula has her own uh, uh, loans and programs that she's been helping small businesses Please utilize everyone out there, including SBS's guidance. We're not out of this, and I need you to survive. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, are we calling Andrew Riggi, followed by Andrea Bowen, and then Ruth Lopez Martinez? Andrew? Time starts Thank now. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you to all the council members. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit association that represents restaurants and nightlife venues throughout the five boroughs. Uh, we're going to submit written comments, but today I just wanted to focus my verbal testimony on supporting the extension of personal liability guarantees in leases. Uh, when COVID first hit, this was one of the main issues that came up when we were speaking with small business owners who were not only fearful because they couldn't pay their rent and they thought they may lose their business, but they knew that if they were unable to pay rent, defaulted on their lease, then their landlord could come after their personal assets and it would only compound the crisis that they were in and that we've now continued to be in for more than one year. Uh, our cities, restaurants, bars, and other small businesses have just been absolutely devastated. While we don't know exactly how many have shuttered, we estimate the numbers in the thousands uh, and countless more teetering on the edge of survival. I saw a recent uh, report come out from the partnership which said about 5,000 restaurants have shuttered and another report from the state controller's office suggested that one third to one half of New York City's 25,000 eating and drinking establishments could shutter without adequate support. And today we have yet to receive adequate support. Uh, just a re uh, report released by our organization in December found that 92% of the restaurants and bars we surveyed in the five boroughs were unable to pay any or full rent in the month of December. So this crisis is going on. Uh, we are still at 35% indoor occupancy for indoor dining. Uh, it's going to exceed to 50%, but we have a long ways off until we get back to 100% and general dining and eating and drinking and socially behavior gets back to pre-pandemic levels. And our workforce has been absolutely devastated. Pre-pandemic, there are about 325,000 jobs in our city's restaurants and bars. There's still more than 140,000 New Yorkers that worked in these businesses pre-pandemic still out of work. So we must, must pass and extend the protections against enforcement of personal liability guarantees and leases. To me, the question is not even how many businesses have permanently shuttered yet. The question is how many of these small businesses are being kept open artificially in large part due to the suspension of personal uh, enforcement of personal liability guarantees. So uh, the Hospitality Alliance strongly supports the extension of this law. It's been critically important in saving people's livelihoods and giving them a fighting chance to get back on their feet, rebuild their- I'm expired. And rebuild New York City. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And again, thank you for your support. And we urge the council uh, to expedite passage of this and for Mayor Blasio to sign it into law immediately. Andrew, thank you. And I wanna thank you for the work that you've been doing and the advocacy that you have uh, done for your members in the restaurant and the food establishment and nightlife. We are right out of the woods and I can't wait till we're able to open 100% safely and there is no safer environment to dine in than dining in where there are uh, protocols in place uh, that the uh, operators of those establishments are going to ensure their diners are safe. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll continue that fight, Andrew, as we get to that 100% reopening uh, safely, which I know that we can do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just add one last thing quickly that anything the council can do to urge the state legislature and the governor to keep and even increase the $1 billion for rent relief and grants to small businesses that were in both of their uh, proposed budgets would be critically important. We really need partnerships between all levels of government to help save these businesses and help save these jobs. So there's some light at the end of the tunnel. We got a long way to go though. So uh, we need support. And again, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next, I will be inviting Andrea Bowen to testify, followed by Ruth Lopez Martinez and then Paula Bueno. Andrea? Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Janai, other council members and staff. My name is Andrea Bowen and I engage in government affairs and policy advocacy 
on behalf of the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives, or NICNOC, um, the local trade association representing worker cooperative businesses and democratic workplaces in the New York City metropolitan area. As a member of the City Council-funded Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, or WCBDI, I'm here on behalf of the 14 organizations that make up initiative, the initiative, asking Council to continue supporting the expansion of worker ownership in uh, the FY22 budget and firmly into the future. Um, thank you, Chair Janai, for being a stalwart supporter, and also thanks to Councilmember Rosenthal for being such a great champion of this initiative. In FY22, we seek a restoration of WCBDI to 3.06 million dollars, which is what we received in FY21, and which was a 15% reduction of our FY20 allocation. We recognize that was, all things considered, pretty good. Um, so we are grateful to get what we were able to receive. Um, and, and during the, we did a lot with it. Um, during the COVID crisis, WCBDI partners provided astounding support to worker co-ops who weathered the storm by using their democratic governance of businesses to maintain wages and keep businesses open. Just some key successes during the COVID crisis. Um, WCBDI part partners supported co-ops and client communication and pivots, you know, so people have to do things online and clean new, you know, do new kinds of cleaning and, you know, take care of different precautions, make different precautions. Um, and we helped businesses adapt to that moment. We assisted worker co-ops in assessing millions of dollars of existing small business relief programs, um, implemented training tailored to emerging needs, such as bilingual info sessions on government support with translated material, um, providing occupational safety training. Um, we stepped up conversions. Um, we've done an owner to owner conversion hotline um, in collaboration with, um, many of our partners have done this in collaboration with the mayor's office to help business owners engage in, um, you know, they're considering retiring, uh, figuring out how to turn their businesses over to their workers. And um, WCBI partners work with them to sort of figure out the finances. How is this going to work? Make sure it's going to be a good match. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, WCBI has met its TA and training goals despite all of the uh, or despite all of the struggles and our many partners who are here today are going to go into de deeper detail about their own businesses and what WCBDI and the co-op model has done to help them persevere. Um, we're happy to provide any information that you uh, request and I will yield my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. I'm very familiar with the work and I'm grateful to you for what you're doing and I continue to support you and your organization. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Next, I will be inviting Ruth Lopez Martinez to testify, followed by Paula Bueno and then Graciela Uraga. For Ruth's testimony, she will be providing her testimony in Spanish and it will be translated in English by Andrea, Andrea after uh, Ruth's testimony is, uh, finishes. Ruth? Time starts now. Okay. Uh, buenas tardes. Um, señor presidente del comité Marchonaps y distinguidos miembros del comité de pequeñas empresas del consejo de la ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Ruth López Martínez. Yo soy una miembro dueña de la cooperativa Palante Green Cleans. Somos una cooperativa de limpieza eh, que nacimos en Jackson Heights. Tenemos cinco años de estar en el comercio. Sin embargo, a pesar de que era un negocio muy próspero, eh, teníamos muy buenos salarios. Con la pandemia, pues el negocio perdió una gran cantidad de clientes, lo que hizo que perdiéramos nuestros espacios y lógicamente mermara las utilidades. Eso significa que no tenemos para pagar los gastos eh, de publicidad, de un espacio físico para nuestra cooperativa. Sin embargo, hemos tenido el apoyo de la iniciativa W Visibility Art, eh, que nos ha apoyado eh, en capacitarnos primeramente para entender este problema de la pandemia y no dejar caer el negocio. Nos han capacitado en tecnología, nos han capacitado en atención al cliente, en administración, Pero todas estas cosas realmente han sido pocas, dada que hemos perdido más del 50% de nuestros clientes y, y lógicamente necesitamos mucho, pero mucho más apoyo. 
Eh, por eso, en el día de hoy, nosotros queremos decirles que además de la WCBDR, necesitamos unos espacios asequibles para las cooperativas y para los pequeños negocios, espacios donde podamos estar con nuestros negocios y no tengamos que salir constantemente porque nos suben la renta. Eh, lógicamente, estos espacios asequibles queremos que nos lleven a tener rentas estabilizadas y así poder tener un negocio estable en un sitio determinado y no estar cada año o cada dos años teniendo que ir de un sitio para otro. Eh, necesitamos que el programa de asistencia de los leasing comerciales continúe. Este programa ha estado, pero ha estado en este momento, eh, se, se ha quedado un poco en paréntesis, entonces queremos que nuevamente continúe, ya que es un programa que ayuda a los pequeños negocios y a las cooperativas que prácticamente están hechas por inmigrantes, por personas de color y por la clase más pobre que tiene este país, ¿no? Entonces necesitamos una ayuda para esto, por eso necesitamos que este programa eh, realmente continúe. Eh, también, por último, necesitamos más apoyo financiero eh, directo en forma de subvenciones y oportunidades de préstamos flexibles. Sabemos que es cierto que, que a través de los bancos particulares se encuentran, pero... Sin embargo, eh, es muy difícil acceder a estos préstamos y por eso necesitamos este tipo eh, de préstamos. Queremos que la ciudad eh, pueda seguir apoyando a la WCBDR para que esta, eh, esta alternativa, eh, pueda esta iniciativa también pueda continuar ayudando a, a las cooperativas para que mejoremos nuestra economía. Y lógicamente al mejorar nuestra economía vamos a mejorar la economía de la ciudad de Nueva York, vamos a pagar más taxes y todos nos vamos a beneficiar de esto. Agradezco mucho la oportunidad que me dan hoy eh, de estar aquí para dar este, este testimonio casi que de auxilio que tenemos en este momento. Muchísimas gracias. Ms. Martínez, we need to translate that, so uh, I hope the translator is up to it. Um, Good afternoon, um, uh, and thank you, Stephanie, for making all of the translation possible. Um, uh, good afternoon to Committee Chair Junai and distinguished members of the New York City Council Small Business Committee. My name is Ruth Lopez Martinez. I am a member of Palante Green Cleaning Cooperative. We are a cooperative of women and immigrants in the industry of commercial, residential, and post-construction cleaning. We have been in the market for five years. We were born in Jackson Heights. Before the pandemic, we had quite considerable growth where worker owners received fair wages with which we could solve our problems in this country and help our families and our countries of origin. However, it is well known by all the pandemic caused a collapse in the entire economy, and that includes us, my cooperative Palante, as well as other worker cooperatives. Fortunately, in this long year of the pandemic, we've had the support of the WCBDI initiative, which has provided us trainings to learn how to handle this pandemic, giving us technological support, support and customer attention. And with advertising, we've learned to use Zoom to make our meetings between members and clients. However, nothing has been enough because we've lost more than 50% of our customers, which means that our income went down significantly. We lost our physical space by not being able to pay rent during this time. This is why we believe that we need some more support to get out of the stagnation that we have at this moment. In addition to WCBDI, we need affordable commercial spaces where we can do business and serve our customers. This affordable space leads us to the need for stabilized rents that businesses do not leave their physical spaces because they cannot afford it. We need the commercial lease assistance program to continue to provide legal support to small, low income, immigrant owned businesses and people of color so they can stay in space, especially during this time. We hope it can be restored in the budget. Finally, we need more direct financial support in the form of grants and accessible loans for small businesses and worker cooperatives. Cooperatives, like many small businesses, face barriers to accessing traditional loans. In this moment, we need more emergency grants and flexible loan opportunities so that our business can continue to stay afloat in these times. I hope the city can continue to support WCBDI help keep businesses affordable leases so they are not displaced and provide more direct support for cooperatives and businesses in this moment. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ruth. Gracias, Senora. Thank you, Ruth. Next, I'll be inviting Paula Bueno to testify. 
followed by Graciela Uraga, and then Gail Johnson. Paula? Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairperson Mark Junai, and distinguished members of the Committee on Small Business of the New York City Council. On behalf of the Workers' Justice Project, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today on the importance of supporting day labor centers and worker-owned cooperatives in a city where immigrants already contribute significantly to our economy. My name is Paola Bueno, and I am here representing the Workers' Justice Project. As an immigrant myself and staff member of the Workers' Justice Project, I feel particularly honored to speak on behalf of our, of our organization that has been for more than 10 years supporting the creation of a stronger, equal and fair economy for our community by engaging immigrant communities and working with day laborers and domestic workers in all five boroughs. We appreciate the New York City's counselor support for the Workers Cooperative Business Initiative in FY21, which has allowed WJP to continue domestic workers to opportunities for continuous training and skill building. Last year, a group of women from WJP began making personal protect protection gear as a way to help their fellow workers and to create a small source of income for themselves. These women are part of the Women's Committee started at the WJP Center in Sunset Park. The Women's Committee has of today distributed over 2,000 face masks to workers. The committee continues to meet and is working on initiatives that support women to earn on an income. Additionally, many of the women who are part of the Women's Committee secure work as domestic workers through our hiring hall, which offers job dispatching. This is possible thanks to the Day Labor Workforce Initiative. This citywide initiative allows us as a worker center to connect responsible employers by connecting them with a skilled and trained workforce that is often neglected from New York City's traditional workforce development services. Because employers know and trust that workers can provide skilled labor and have been trained and assessed, they are willing to pay higher wages. The center also plays a role in in revitalizing the local economy, creating over a million dollars in revenue every year through increased wages. Through the day labor center, workers have been able to increase their salaries by 30 to 40%. We urge the, the council to support the expansion and development of these key initiatives, worker cooperative business development initiative with funding of 3.1 million in FY22 and the day labor and worker initiative with funding of 3.2 million. It is through your enhanced support that we can work on the development of new and creative opportunities for immigrants in the, in the economy of our city. We will continue to expand our services and reach to provide more construction safety and skill building training, outreach and education, wage staff prevention and technical assistance services to developing cooperatives. Um, that is all and I yield my time. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for testimony. Um, Stephanie, I know that we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez, and I believe his hand is up. You may have a question or statement that he wants to make. Yeah, Chairman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for your leadership in this committee. Uh, I want to pick up on what Ruth said. Uh, 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 Ruth, el trabajo ustedes hacen muy importante la cooperativa, y tenemos que seguir trabajando como ciudad para apoyarla. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight is that when we did the inward rezoning, uh, one of the, piece, uh, the pieces that we include in that rezoning is that in the inward rezoning, we established that if a developer is building a commercial space with city funding, a percentage of that space will be affordable to local small businesses. So I think that that can be a model. And, and I think that based on what when the mayor said and and the first deputy mayor at that time it became the first uh, project that was done with that con with that concept so i hope again that as Ruth and all the members in her uh, uh, cooperative are trying to identify how they can get affordable space to maintain the small businesses that all of us together from the small business community continue advocating uh, to city hall so that from now on, any rezoning, any developers that build commercial space, if they get affordable, if they get some subsidy, they should provide a percentage of commercial space affordable to local small businesses. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Next up, we have Graciela Uraga, who will be providing her testimony in Spanish. And the previous counsel, Paula Bueno, will be translating her testimony in English. 
And then followed by, uh, after Graciela, we have Gail Johnson and then Maria Scalfani. Graciela? Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, honorable Mark Joing y distinguidos miembros del Comité de Pequeños Negocios de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Graciela Uraga, soy de México. Soy miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral y me gustaría contarles un poco de mi historia. Primero, quiero agradecerles la oportunidad de testiguar hoy. Yo llegué aquí en este país en el año de 1995. Yo llegué sin conocer nada y sin saber nada en mi búsqueda de un trabajo digno para poder proveer un mejor futuro a mis hijos. He vivido muchas necesidades. He aguantado muchas humillaciones. Y, y por, ningún, por ningún motivo nosotros los los inmigrantes podemos vivir y por lo tanto eh, con tanta con tanta riqueza de este de este país eh, uno sufra esas carencias entonces pues nosotros eh, en, en la lucha de mi búsqueda de un trabajo digno me re, me, res, me donde me re, me respalden me valoren en el proyecto de justicia laboral. Encontré este apoyo de, que yo tanto buscaba y donde yo comencé a salir a, a sobresalir adelante. Eh, empezando con los entrenamientos que ofrece mi hogar porque me paso más tiempo en este lugar que en mi casa para seguir este, estudiando aquí, me entrena, aquí nos ofrecen el entrenamiento de la OSHA 30 y la SST y, y con con mucho esfuerzo he, he salido adelante y dueña de este Y, este, y pues gracias a, gracias a eso, nosotros hemos tratado de salir adelante y lo que le queremos pedir es que nos apoyen a este, a este lugar. Y hoy, hoy más que nunca, yo quiero decirle que pues gracias a esos entrenamientos, nunca, nunca más voy a, este, a decir... Um, Volver a, volver a pasar el tiempo atrás dependiendo de, de otras personas y lo que yo quiero de, decir que el, gracias a todo es, de esto que nosotros estamos este, tomando estos entrenamientos nosotros podemos impulsar a los demás tiempo, a seguir adelante y no, y no depender de, lo, de los de, de, de mucho del de, de la, como dice uno, carga pública, nosotros no queremos ser carga pública, lo que nosotros queremos es el apoyo de todos ustedes para que nosotros podamos tomar iniciativas y así como yo logré estar ahora este, progresando, a mí me gustaría que los demás recibieran el mismo apoyo y sin este centro nosotros no hubiéramos recibido, bueno, al menos lo digo, no podríamos recibir este mejor apoyo que es el lugar, que, que es el centro que apoya a la mayoría de nosotros, los emigrantes, que no tenemos este apoyo económico de, de la ciudad, sino que es de nuestro esfuerzo, que somos los que más aportamos y somos los que salimos en esta pandemia a salir a, a, sobre, a, a hacer los trabajos que otras personas que no que tienen papeles no se atrevieron a hacer. Nosotros nos atrevemos a hacer sin saber el peligro de lo que uno está este, soportando eh, por lo que estamos pasando en esta crisis. Eh, y hoy este, me gustaría pues, que ustedes nos apoyaran. Hoy, este, ay, hoy me gustaría... El que me gustaría que ustedes apoyaran el, las citas de jornaleros, que sería el 3.1 millones para que 
mis otros compañeros puedan seguir existiendo y respaldando en la comunidad que estamos aquí luchando. Y pues eh, ahora yo pertenezco a un, este, a un, un, este, um, eh, un comité que estamos, que se llama Hilando Sueños, que empezamos nosotros ahora de la pandemia a, a hacer mascarillas, que estuvimos distribuyendo para toda la comunidad que estaban muy escasas las mascarillas. Y gracias a este centro que nos empezó a entrenar para poder uno salir adelante, nosotros lo hicimos y apoyamos en lo que más pudimos. Y pues es, este, eso es todo lo que yo, yo les puedo decir, que, que, que nos apoye más que nada este centro para que así pueda tener más, más capacitaciones para todos los demás compañeros y podamos salir adelante y como se lo acabé de decir anteriormente no ser una carga pública y gracias, se los agradezco por haberme, haberme dado esta eh, oportunidad de darles mi testimonio, muchas gracias a todos Gracias Graciela uh -huh. I think Paolo is going to, okay, there we go. Yeah. Time starts now. Um, buenos dias. Um, good morning, Chairperson um, Junai and distinguished members of the Committee on Small Business Services. My name is Gab Garcia Lauraga. I am a member of the Workers' Justice Project, a Brooklyn-based worker center and proud member of the New York City Day Labor Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I arrived in this country in 1995. I arrived without knowing anything and without knowing anything. In my search for a decent job to be able to provide a better future for my children, I have experienced abuse and endured humiliations that no human being should live in a city with so much wealth and in a city where immigrants are the ones who do the work which is most difficult and, imp and important but are very poorly paid. My struggle to find a decent job where I am respected and valued led me to find the Workers' Justice Project. A Brooklyn-based worker center. The center is my second home because I spend more than more time there than in my own home. But above all, this is where I found the support I need to help my family move forward. The Workers' Justice Project has helped me empower myself, helping me find my voice, regain my strength, and regain and regain my self-esteem. WJP has given me the opportunity to have access to educational and training opportunities such as leadership training, OSHA 30, SST, and many more. These opportunities paved the way for me to be the owner of the cooperative, Iliando Sueños. My, co my cooperative focuses on personal protective equipment. The center supports small business owners such as myself. Their dedication and commitment to our success has made it possible for me to have my own business. I am here to request that you continue to fund the Workers' Cooperative Business Initiative. The Workers' Justice Project is a member of this initiative. In conclusion, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We hope that you will consider day labor centers and cooperatives as part of your priorities during this year's budget negotiation process. And we look forward to continuing to work closely with you. Thank you, Graciela and, pa and Paula. Next, we will be inviting Gail Johnson to testify, followed by Maria Scalfani and then Marvis Burns. Gail? Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members of the committee. My name is Gail Johnson. I'm a worker owner of the Hopewell Care Child Care Cooperative. I'm also here on behalf of New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives. Hopewell Care, our co-op, consists of immigrant women of color and was formed to create employment, uh, mutual support, and a sense of pride in our workers while providing a much needed service for all communities across New York City. Childcare is not a socially distancing job. Uh, some workers experience challenges as a result of this pandemic. And so we secured small grants um, from allied organizations like National Domestic Workers Alliance and of course, New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives. A grant through NICNOC um, was given to us through 
the um, Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, WCBDI, and these grants provide training for members in Zoom technology, uh, legal support, which is given by Take Root Justice, and um, it's assisted members in industry standard training as well as health and Carol Garden Association has been our incubator and continues to support our co-op throughout this process. Co-op business needs more direct support from the city, and we believe that the city can restore the commercial lease assistance program and pass long-term commercial rent stabilization to prevent businesses from being displaced, especially in this pandemic. As co-op, it's extremely difficult to access loans as financial support. We believe the city should do more to provide grants and loans to small businesses, including worker co-ops in need. And for this reason, we support the creation of public bank so that the city can invest its public dollars back into communities like ours, small businesses. And we also hope that you can support the passage of intro 2099 and intro 2031. We hope the city can work with us with these efforts. And thank you so much for your time. And thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Gail. You're welcome. Thank you, Gail. Next, I'll be inviting Maria Scalfani to testify, followed by Marcus Burns and then Ai Young Kim. Maria? Hi, starts Gail. now. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to, to testify. Excuse the mask. I'm actually at St. John's Hospital getting my COVID shot. So that's great. I agree with everything that everybody has testified and said so far. However, I'd like to approach this from a different angle um, for the experience of somebody like myself. I am a small business owner. There are only three of us in our business. The biggest issue that we have with all the state and government entities is that there is no response or support when you reach out to get an answer. And if you do get hear back from somebody with their answer, it's usually after the fact or when the situation has gone to the wayside. I have put in for PPP money for my small business as an event planner in the corporate industry. My business is 90% stopped. There are no conferences going on. There is no income coming in. And I must say that everybody who works for a company that gets a paycheck every month and they don't have to worry about uh, great gaining the revenue themselves to get themselves paid and their family have never been given the proper attention to succeed in this business. I'm also noticing that as of late with those businesses that have opened, some of the bigger stores are increasing their prices tremendously to make up for the business that they lost. And I have to believe there's something that the Small Business Association, the Small Business of the State can step in and, and, and curb and help so that we don't get raped by the prices increasing so that we can get some help for the landlords. I filed on January 29th for my PPP money. This is March 17th. And I am still fighting with the lenders and I've gotten no response from the Small Business Administration. So it's very frustrating and it's very disheartening. And if it wasn't for Chair Jonai's office, I really don't know what I would have done or my partner would have done or how I would have fed my family. So I hope those are some of the issues that you people are gonna address going forward. In addition to all of the bigger global issues that everybody else has been mentioning. Thank you for my time. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to getting things back to, to normal the way they've always been. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you for uh, testifying. Even from within the hospitals, you get your COVID test or your COVID vaccination. I promise you based, and if you heard the conversation, the testimony of the commissioner, I will get in touch with them over your matters to see how we can get you the additional loans and grants that you need to survive. This Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, Maria. Next, I'll be calling Marvis Burns, followed by Ai Young Kim, and then Tara Nares Nareski. Marvis? Time starts now. Form an opportunity to, to speak. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, 
But yes, uh, as, as said, my name is Marvis Burns and I'm the co-owner of a family owned small business. Um, and we are a holistic health practice with two locations, 30 plus staff members and thousands of customers in New York and really across the country. Um, we're currently in a commercial lease with, uh, unfortunately, a slum landlord in Manhattan's 125th um, prize corridor. And despite you know, myself having an MBA arguably from the world's best institution, I had no clue how to handle these negotiations with my first commercial lease. Um, I tried to save money. <laughs> I uh, leveraged some colleagues that I knew that were attorneys and they understood the law, but um, you know, they weren't seasoned real estate, seasoned New York attorneys um, that focus in, in real estate. And that was to my detriment um, because we went through the, the contract and we had set everything up and thought we were prepared. But five years later, I realized it was the worst mistake I think I made in the business because it's, issues after issues that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, the contract says it's on us as, um, you know, as the leasees and it's busted pipes. We got hit with an excessive tax bill. Uh, there, we're, we're dealing with rodent issues that are not because of us, but it's because of poor uh, facility that we operate in. And it's just, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame as to what it is that we're dealing with. And I, um, you know, I now realize how important it is to have organizations like Take Root, who we're dealing with as we're trying to get out of our current situation and getting into a new lease, and having you know attorneys that understand the the industry and not just understand the industry, but understand these landlords um, who have built a, a reputation for the disasters that, that they put other tenants through and having to look up the research, do, do the research and identify other, um, you know, tenants like myself and realize that, you know, we, we don't really have the power. Uh, and so, you know, Take Root has been a silver lining for us as we gear up, you know, with to sign this new lease. And we're trying to avoid all of those mistakes that we made, especially when I say that, you know, this current lease is a, a 35 page lease that we've been asked to go through. Um, New York landlords have maintained like the upper hand and for us, you know, to have some um, hired help and it was afforded to us through this program. I think it was, it's to our benefit and I would hope that you guys continue to find the funding for organizations because it's great, it's helpful and it's much needed. Time expired. Thank you, Marvis. I promise that I'll be fighting to restore um, that to the budget to ensure that you and uh, all the other small businesses can take advantage of that expertise. Survive, Marvis. Just survive right now. That's what we need you to do. Thank you, Marvis. Thank you. Next, next I'll be calling Ah Young Kim, followed by Karen Narevsky, and then Arthur Katz. Ah Young? Time starts now. We don't hear you, Ah Young. You're muted. Nope. Hi, Yang, we can return to you later. Um, you can just check your audio in the meantime. Okay, next I'll call uh, Karen Narevsky, followed by Arthur Katz, and then Ashna Singh. Karen? Time starts now. Great, can you guys hear me? Great. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Karen Narevsky. I'm the Senior Organizer for Equitable Economic Development at ANHD, um, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. We're one of the city's leading policy advocacy and capacity building organizations, um, and our membership consists of over 80 neighborhood-based and citywide nonprofits that have affordable housing or equitable economic development as a key part of their mission. Um, we bridge the power and impact of all of our member groups to really build community power and ensure the right to thriving equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. Uh, we're also in that work, a member and convener of the United for Small Business New York City Coalition and the Industrial Jobs Coalition. These groups respectively bring together organizations from around the city that provide services and lead advocacy to support our commercial corridors and our industrial business zones. 
both of which are a key part of the city's economy that face consistent challenges from speculation and rising rents. Um, and primarily, I want to ask the council today to ensure funding for two key programs supported by SBS, uh, the Commercial Lease Assistance Program, which many uh, folks have already spoken about, and the Industrial Business Service Program. Uh, we also support the extension of the personal liability protections um, in Local Law 55 to June of this year, and the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative Program. Um, but I'll speak a little bit more about the CLA program and about the Industrial Business Zone program. Um, so the CLA program, as you all know, was started in 2016 and was strongly supported by advocacy from United for Small Business New York City. Um, it's the only city funded legal source, uh, sorry, source of free legal assistance for small business, and it really provides services that other consultants and legal service programs do not offer. Um, and as you can tell by the variety of business owners, community groups, and legal service providers on this call, it's really helped to strengthen the ecosystem of small business supports in low-income commercial corridors. Um, and as you can imagine, since the pandemic hit, requests for assistance have gone through the roof. So we really appreciate the, commit, the commissioner's commitment to maintaining the program. Uh, it would be a huge mistake not to continue it as businesses need to get out of the pandemic. And we also really want to allow it to expand so it can keep pace with the demand for, um, for services and really offer those services in multiple languages. Um, I also want to draw attention to another sector of small business that is particularly critical to the city's equitable recovery, which is the industrial and manufacturing sector. Um, so industrial businesses in particular are playing a key role in keeping the city going through the pandemic uh, with food distribution, production uh, of personal protective equipment, provision of utilities and other essential services. While the city and state actually saw a net job loss in December of last year, the industrial sectors added more jobs than any other sector. Um, and throughout the city, we have over 40,000 industrial businesses that are supported by eight nonprofit industrial business service providers. Time expired. Um, I'll wrap up my testimony briefly. These nonprofits really play a key role in helping to retain and grow our industrial businesses, provide training and technical assistance, um, and also really serve as a liaison between the industrial business zones and city agencies and elected officials. Uh, we'd like to see those contracts um, not just funded, but also restored to pre-pandemic levels as the IBSPs are doing considerably more work uh, as they scramble to address uh, the impacts of COVID. So um, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We urge the council to prioritize continued funding for the industrial business service provider contracts and to restore funding for the commercial lease assistance program. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we're going to try you, Ayang. Are Is your audio back? I think. Great. So, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So we'll okay. we'll invite you now to testify and then Arthur Katz and then Ashna Singh. Go ahead, Ayan. Thank Time you. starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Ayan Kim and I am the Associate Director of Small Business Programs at the Asian American Federation. In the past year, our staff has been inundated with calls from immigrant small business owners asking for information or support applying to assistance programs, citing lack of language access and procedural assistance. Business owners called in with desperation as they were lost in terms of what capacity they may carry on with their livelihoods. Restaurant owners reported constant harassment with inconsistent and hostile inspe inspections and with no avenue to cure their violations. LAP business owners are discouraged from reaching out to programs that provide invaluable assistance like the CLA program out of fear that they will not be able to communicate with legal counsel that city provides. Webinars by city agencies are near impossible to set access for those who are hardest to reach, but they are still supposed to know all the new regulations or how they're uh, else they are going to be severely punished. As if all of this is not enough reason to give up, our community today faces racist attacks that stoke fear and kill local businesses. Horrendous incidents like that of last night in Georgia confirm the immediate threat our community faces and suppress hope for economic recovery. Over 60% of Asian small business owners we surveyed last summer answered that they're worried about anti-Asian bias or hate crime for themselves, their business or staff. We do not see enough reaction from the business side or security side and from this um, city. And we hope, to see, we hope to see a response from the city to make sure our business owners are feeling safe and given the assistance they need. 
During the height of the pandemic, Asians went from filing hundreds of claims a month to thousands of claims a month in, in terms of unemployment claim. Many of these industries that employ low income Asian workers and operate as small businesses are hard to hit, are hard as hit by job losses. These in industries are sectors like beauty and nail salons or laundromats, food services and retail. And these are also industries that face difficulty in organizing to lobby for their interests. In discussing how to bring out economic recovery, the needs and concerns from our community continues to be ignored. Their feedback on inspection practice reform has not been reflected to legislative efforts like intro 2233. No one is reaching out to business groups that serve immigrant small business owners for feedback or to listen in on their needs. We welcome efforts like intro 2233 or 7265, but without proper outreach and support, our community will remain in the dark and unable to benefit from such protective measures. We are grateful for the words of support and empathy for immigrant small business owners from this committee and request that the support be materialized into meaningful assistance and engagement. Asian small businesses accounted for about half of net new economic activity and half Time of expired. new employment in New York City from 2002 to 2012, which overlaps with the la last recession. New York City cannot move on to recovery without empowering our community and failing to address their needs will only extend our road to recovery to a perilous journey. With these concerns, we request the council to allocate funding for an Asian small business center. Their needs struggling to overcome systematic barriers like those mentioned I just now. Also, I I'd like to ask for the council to secure and expand funding for commercial lease assistance program and to ensure services are available in major languages of New York City. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify and for your continued support. I'd be happy to answer any questions and look forward to working with you closely. Thank you, Ayang. Next, I'll be calling Arthur Katz, followed by Ashna Singh and then Karina Kaufman Gutierrez. Arthur? Time starts now. Chair Joe and I, uh, and members of the Committee on Small Business, I can't thank you enough for listening and talking to me. This is the first night I will sleep well in months. That was my small business client's response after my sincerest apologies to her for not having any good news to share about her legal options to, sh to save her shop. My name is Arthur Katz. I'm the director of the Microenterprise Project at Volunteers of Legal Service, or VALS. We're one of the three nonprofit legal service providers who partner with SBS under the Commercial Lease Assistance Program. And since 2018, CLA's five public interest attorneys have provided free legal representation to hundreds of lower income small business owners in over 1,200 legal matters. We focus on communities that need it the most, small business owners of color, women, immigrants, those with limited English proficiency and businesses in outer boroughs. CLA is the only option for most of our clients to work with and speak with an attorney. And over the past year, we've adapted to become a crisis management program and we get results. I urge you to ensure that funding for the CLA program is restored, expanded and baseline before it expires on June 30th so that we can continue to serve our existing clients and meet the nonstop need throughout our city. And I'd like to share just one example out of the hundreds. A tattoo business spent the past decade cultivating an impeccable name for itself in its industry. The pandemic struck and because government orders kept personal services like theirs shut for months, our client accumulated six figures worth of debt arrears uh, in rent. Despite the business owner's own best efforts over the ensuing eight months of negotiations, their landlord refused to consider any compromise whatsoever and faced with an impasse um, with the potential for lifelong personal financial ruin, the client contacted SBS, was screened for CLA services, and was placed with attorneys at my team at Balls. We immediately reviewed the client's lease. We advised them of their, um, their options under the law. And within days, we negotiated a lease amendment with the landlord, settling the arrears. We lowered the rent for the remainder of this year, 2021, and we eased restrictions on the client's personal guarantee. Since the beginning of the COVID crisis, the CLA program has seen a tenfold increase surge in requests for help like just like this one. And last year, the program was eliminated from the budget and then reestablished in the fall. That created a gap in service at the time when businesses needed it the most. 
CLA is a racial justice program. It's an economic justice program, and we are an eviction prevention program. And with mass evictions looming when the moratorium expires shortly, we are today, again, seeking your commitment to not only restore, but to expand sorely needed legal services for small business owners before it's too late. Lastly, on a separate note, I wanna strongly support the bill to extend personal liability protections. We supported you last summer during your initial introduction. I'm expired. And your first extension of this bill, Balls has fought and is fighting alongside SBS and the law department as a friend of the court to ensure that this legislation withstands scrutiny. And in fact, I'm running as soon as I'm done here to go continue work on our brief to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals that's due in short order. So we thank you for your partnership, for your service, for your support for small businesses in our city. And to that end, I urge that you refund, expand, and baseline the commercial lease assistance program. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you for, for the wonderful work that you're doing and the businesses that you are helping and ensuring survive. Grateful to you. Thank you, Arthur. Next, I'll be inviting Ashna Singh to testify, followed by Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, and then Rachel Z. Ashna? Time starts now. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Ashna Singh. I am the Program Associate for the Community and Economic Development Program at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A. We represent low and moderate income individuals and families throughout New York City. Our clients live in rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods where many residents and small business owners have been displaced and are facing displacement and harassment. Brooklyn A has had the honor to serve as the lead organization implementing the Commercial Lease Assistance Program in close collaboration with Volunteers of Legal Service and Take Root Justice. We also work intimately with 10 community-based organizations with close ties to neighborhoods hit hardest by the pandemic, two in each borough to ensure outreach and education. The Commercial Lease Assistance Program provides free, high quality legal counsel to small businesses for transactional services. Since its inception, the Commercial Lease Assistance Program has now addressed over 1,400 legal matters, the demographics of whom consist of business owners from all five boroughs, every city council district, and whom are 99% low income, 75% individuals of color, 64% immigrants, 51% women, 33% non-native English speakers, 20% sole proprietors, and the majority with five or fewer employees. As the program associate, I conduct intake for the program. I speak to many business owners daily who need legal assistance. The demand for this program since the onset of COVID-19 in New York City has exponentially increased. Our already vulnerable business owners are facing unprecedented additional adversity. Every day, I hear from business owners struggling to pay rent, racking up debt over the last several months, and more recently, increased landlord harassment. Often, they just want to know what their rights and obligations are under the pandemic circumstances. On top of facing a multitude of difficulties, hiring a private attorney is an expense that our city's small business owners simply cannot endure, especially in this time. The Commercial Lease Assistance Program is the only city-funded free legal service program that provides full legal representation for small businesses. It is crucial that we secure the continuity of this program into the next fiscal year and beyond to keep it as a dependable resource for our city's business owners, especially as we recover from the ongoing impact of COVID-19. So today, I come with an ask and echo my colleagues who have spoken today to support the restoration, but also the expansion and stabilization of our program's funding to also allow representation of nonprofits and to get compensated for legal education as well as the ask to extend the personal liability bill protections. Again, I ask for the continued support and also advocacy to expand funding and ensure the permanence of the commercial lease assistance program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful work. And that number was 1,400. Is that what you said? Oh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashna. Next, I'll be inviting Karina Kaufman Gutierrez to testify followed by Rachel Z and then Kathleen Riley. Karina? Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Jonah and all who are present today. My name is Karina Kaufman Gutierrez and I'm the Deputy Director of the Street Vendor Project, which is a member of the United for Small Business Coalition. 
SVP is a membership-based organization working to improve the working conditions of the approximately 20,000 people who sell food and merchandise on the streets and sidewalks of New York City. Um, we were founded in 2001 and we strive to improve and expand vending as a viable, lawful employment option for immigrants, military veterans, and other entrepreneurs. Um, I'm first asking the council to restore and expand funding for the commercial lease assistance program in this budget so that brick and mortar small businesses can receive the necessary free legal support needed as many of my colleagues have highlighted as essential today. Um, additionally, I wanna share that SVP is the only organization in New York City that works exclusively with street vendors. And with a staff of six, we have really been the only place where thousands of street vendors reach out to for everything from education on street vending rules and regulations, to small business development and loan applications, registering for tax IDs, filing sales tax forms, immigration assistance, you name it, we are the one-stop shop for street vendors with a very small staff. Um, we're reached out to because we have a long history working within the community and know the intricacies of the vending system and provide services in five different languages. Um, SVP appreciates the critical support that we have received from New York City Council in previous years to provide these critical services. And we respectfully request for New York City Council to further develop and expand um, the essential multilingual services that we offer. Um, vendors are city's smallest business owners who provide fresh, affordable food and merchandise um, across the five boroughs and contribute nearly $293 million to the city's economy each year. Um, as the only organization that focuses on street vendors, our services have been in extremely high demand throughout COVID-19. We have connected nearly 3,000 street vendors to resources and information about housing, food access, and loan and grant opportunities just within the last year. Um, in addition to providing um, these critical resources, we are asking City Council to support um, the increased growth of our outreach and education specialist team. Um, which connects vendors to our small business consultation program and an environmental justice program as well. Through our consultation program, we equip members with tools, resources, and skills needed to grow their businesses, including small business legal services, financial literacy, microloans, e-payments, um, and personal finance management. Additionally, through our environmental justice initiative, we aim to reduce the environmental footprint of our city of our city street vendors, um, helping vendors adopt waste management practices um, that minimize the use of foam and plastics and maximize recyclable items. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Karina. Next, I'll be inviting Rachel Z to testify, followed by Kathleen Riley and then Abigail Elman. Rachel? Good afternoon, Time Chair. Now. Oh, sorry, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Janaj and members of the Committee on Small Business. Here's another reality of what's going on in our community due to the pandemic. Many small landlords like us are barely surviving COVID this year. Small landlords are small businesses too. And uh, we're not like the giant corporate landlords that own many, many buildings throughout the boroughs of New York City. We've been providing rent relief to our tenants in need because we believe that our city will rebound. As property owners of two buildings in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, we really have a terrible situation there as do many small landlords in our community and in other areas of Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy and the Bronx, for example. We got an inspection on December 29th, 2020 that was mandated by local law 152, which this committee um, created. And now the city expects us to make repairs in this report by our plumber by April 15th or latest June 30th, and or we get a $10,000 fine per building. So now we're about to get penalized $20,000 by the DOB unless we come up with $45,000, which is debt service of 1,300 a month in, um, you know, to complete glass, gas line replacement within six months of receiving the inspection results. This year, we kept all of our tenants in their homes. The, we have the 20 sided store, a really beautiful shop. We kept our musicians, we kept our video artists and the regular working people. We reduced our rents by half. Without being negotiated with, we 
offered um, leniency. We are, we are not collecting arrears and we've done everything we could possibly do. But if the tenants default, we would lose our home and our life's work in investments. As SBS uh, Commissioner John L. Doris stated earlier in this meeting, fines and fees must be reduced to make New York City more conducive to businesses who, is, who have invested in our neighborhoods. The pandemic created a situation where people are out of work. You wanna read this? Oh, sure. Uh, these people have had a tough time keeping up uh, with their rent and monthly bills, as we all know. Uh, Rachel and myself, my name is Omar Hakeem, by the way. We are touring musicians and homeowners. <clears throat> And we haven't been able to work either uh, due to the COVID restrictions. Uh, we don't have our, our normal concert touring income nor studio work. As a matter of fact, uh, we just borrowed on credit cards in order to keep uh, one of our properties safe, about $85,000 on emergency repairs to a property on Grand Street. And we're now struggling to pay those things off with credit cards. And our other tenants are suffering and three apartments are about half rent and another one is three months behind. So, you know, again, our idea is we've been helping our tenants with our goal is to keep everybody safe, keep everybody where they are so that we can get past this. But on top I'm of expired. that, okay, many of, the, uh, many of the tenants have received the COVID hardship letter. I'm gonna try to wrap this up now. Um, <clears throat> what we're seeking, and we're hoping that the that there would be a revision to the LL uh, 152. And when I'm thinking in light of the one in two family properties that are already exempt, we seek an exemption for these uh, buildings that are three and four families as well. Uh, we're also looking for funding. I, I heard earlier that there's possibility of no interest loans and grants and things like that. Uh, so thank you very much for, for hearing us. And, um, we really appreciate this time. Thank you. Rachel, Omar, thank you for testifying and for sharing uh, your hardships with us. Um, I'm going to get my phone number to you. Um, I'm sure that we have your email somehow that we can stay in touch and I can help figure out how you're going to get through this compliance issue uh, and hopefully uh, help you get a little bit more time and the funds to a loan or grant program that will help you make those improvements. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for working with your tenants. So there are landlords out there that do work with their tenants. Could you imagine that? Yeah, we need stewardship from the from the landlord side, you know. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Hello, my name is Noah Meixler, policy analyst to the Committee on Small Business, and I will be taking over moderating duties for this hearing. I will next be calling on Kathleen Riley to testify. After Kathleen Riley, I will be calling on Abigail Elman and then Michaela Skocknick. Kathleen? Time starts now. Thank you, everyone. My name is Kathleen Riley from the New York State Restaurant Association. <clears throat> um, thank you so much for holding this hearing today. Thank you to Councilmember Rivera for sponsoring the additional extension of the personal liability protections. NYSER is wholeheartedly in support of extending these protections. Um, so the law which prevents personal liability provisions in commercial leases from being enforced against COVID related defaults has provided both protection and peace of mind to New York City restaurants over the last year. And without intervention, it would expire at the end of the month. We recognize the protections have already been extended before. And while that new date seemed reasonable back in September, the holiday surge of COVID-19, the second shutdown of indoor dining, and the timelines for vaccination and the Federal Restaurant Revitalization Fund are all contributing to the current need for a second extension. Um, the support to extend actions is widely popular among our membership and operators in New York City. The holiday surge of COVID-19, which triggered a second shutdown of indoor dining in New York City, represented a major setback in the road to recovery from the pandemic that we did not foresee in September. This winter has been incredibly difficult for restaurants as outdoor dining has been severely limited by the weather and even increases in takeout and delivery failed to make up the difference. In a recent survey we conducted in partnership with the National Restaurant Association, we found that increased takeout and delivery orders only for under 30% of lost on-premise business for most restaurant operators. The losses of the restaurant industry over the last year are immense and restaurants are still in a vulnerable position at this point. 
Looking forward, the ongoing vaccination effort and the recent passage of the federal stimulus, which includes the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, seem poised to make a difference for our operators. While restaurant employees themselves are currently, thankfully, eligible for vaccines at this point, that's just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to scaling up consumer confidence necessary for business to return to normal. In the next few months, as more and more New Yorkers are vaccinated, we expect that confidence to rise. Um, beyond the vaccination process, there's also the anticipation of receiving an influx of federal support from the Restaurant Revitalization Fund in the coming months. While this stimulus has been passed and signed into law, we do still expect some friction and lag between now and when money is actually received by restaurant operators. Thankfully, President Biden has indicated that he wants to prioritize and expedite getting this fund up and running. But even so, between turnover at the SBA and the likely sort of growing pains of creating a brand new program, our partners at the National Restaurant Association predict funds will be distributed by May at the earliest. So we eagerly anticipate our operators receiving those funds. That being said, I also want to acknowledge that the total available money, which is $28.6 billion, is less than 12% of the estimated $240 billion that the industry nationally lost in 2020. So we absolutely applaud the passage of funds. We want to remain realistic at the same time about what it will mean for the recovering restaurant industry of New York City. So all of that is to say, three more months of personal liability protection would be a really meaningful way for the city to assist the restaurant industry. We really appreciate you considering this extension um, and we are eager to collaborate with you all in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Grateful to you for all that you do and continue to do. Side by side, Kathleen, we'll get there. Thank you. I will next be calling on Abigail Elliman to testify. After Abigail Elliman, I'll be calling on Michaela Skocknick and then Jesse Galvez. Abigail? Time starts now. Thank you very much, Chairman Jonai, members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. My name is Abigail Elman. I'm the Director of Planning and Development at the Cooper Square Committee, a community development organization in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. We work with area residents to preserve and develop affordable housing and community and cultural spaces so that the Lower East Side remains racially, economically, and culturally diverse. And of course, Part of that work is engaging and working with small businesses who form an essential part of the cultural fabric of the neighborhood. Um, as some of my colleagues in United for Small Business uh, NYC have asked already, I'm asking for the council to restore and expand funding for the commercial lease assistance program in this budget so that small businesses can receive necessary free legal support. And further, we recommend extending the personal liability protections as introduced by council member Rivera. Um, Cooper Square Committee has worked as community partners involved in the CLA program since its inception in 2018. And since that time, um, we have seen hundreds of small business owners benefit from the services that are uh, provided, the majority of whom are people of color, immigrants, and women. Um, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, We've seen a surge in the number of businesses needing lease negotiation assistance. Earlier in this uh, hearing, we heard from Kunsin Keldon of DOCOM, one of the community uh, members that we work with, one of the small businesses that we've worked with. Um, and I think later in this hearing, we'll hear from Mr. Jesse Galvez of J. Antonio Gallery. So I won't reiterate their testimony, but in general, the top concern that businesses come to us with is renegotiating rent. These new, these negotiations uh, involve an individual small business leaseholder and a powerful property owner and free legal services for commercial tenants provide an essential piece of support to what would otherwise be a grossly unequal negotiation. Um, as has also been stated last year, the program was eliminated from the budget and then reestablished in fall 2020, creating a gap in services. And I remember at that time, businesses were coming to me uh, needing support and um, you can just imagine how destructive that was to those businesses who were really looking for support and there, there was no clarity about what was happening with the program. So um, we must sort of avoid a repeat of that sort of um, removing and replacing the funding. It's just too vital a source of support for businesses. So again, we asked the committee to um, renew, expand funding for the CLA program in the fiscal year 2022 budget. Um, after all, this is a program that has seen a tenfold increase in requests for help. 
and to push for permanent baseline funding for the program in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail, and I hear you loud and clear. Grateful to you. Thank you. I will next be calling on Michaela Skoknik to testify. After Michaela Skoknik, I will be calling on Jesse Galvez and then Olympia Kazi. Michaela? Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Gnoyai and members of the Small Business Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mikaela Skoknic. I'm Industrial Programs Manager of Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. SBADC is a four decade old nonprofit supporting industrial businesses and workers along the working waterfronts of Sunset Park, Red Hook, and Gowanus. I'm asking the council to restore and expand funding for the industrial business service provider program in this budget so the businesses in RIBC can continue to thrive, grow, and help lead a more just economic recovery from the pandemic. As an IBSP, our organization provides free technical assistance, workforce development services, financing assistance, MWBE certification, business planning, succession planning, so that industrial firms can continue to do businesses, to continue to do business in Brooklyn. In a city where affordable and accessible industrial land is scarce, IBSPs are a key component to business retention, strengthening a sector that pays higher wages and offers more career opportunities to a workforce that is 80% people of color and 50% foreign born. Additionally, these companies are key to the city's ability to respond to emergencies. Here's an example. This year, we helped a small garment manufacturer gain a contract with the federal government to pivot and create PPE. We also help them secure two loans to be able to hire 20 more people for their production. This business and our assistance were both critical in the COVID recovery strategy. In the last 12 months, SBADC has provided free technical assistance to over 380 firms. SBADC and our, fellows, uh, and our fellow IBSPs have worked tirelessly to manage and connect businesses to federal, state, and city products, including PPE, PPP, IDL, New York Forward Loan, Small Business Continuity Loan, and LMI Storefront Loan. Every year, our scope of services has increased, along with the demand for assistance from small, from small industrial companies and entrepreneurs, yet this increase in services has not come with an increase in budget. Appropriate levels of funding for the IBC program will ensure that we are able to serve the many businesses that rely upon us for support. Industrial businesses keep New York City running, provide opportunities for upward mobility, and are essential to an equitable recovery of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michaela. Great to see you loud and clear. Thank you. I will next be calling on Jesse Galvez to testify. After Jesse Galvez, I will be calling on Olympia Kazi and then Leah Archibald. Jesse? Time starts now. Hi, can you guys hear me? I think you can hear me, right? Yes. My name's Jesse Galvez, and I'm one of your small businesses down on the Lower East Side. And uh, I've been in business since 1975. Uh, whereas, whereas, deposition, amendment, complaints, all those words, they don't mean anything to me. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, these words were on a proposal sent from my landlord who wanted me to postpone my rent, not to forgive it, but just to postpone it. And like, I'm listening to all these people, we've all had the same trouble. The landlords never heard of COVID-19. They didn't, you know, I mean, just give us the money. It's due, it's in your lease. And that was it. And it really struck fear in my heart. And uh, I'm a great retailer. I'm a very good watchmaker. I'm a fantastic artist. I am your best friend, but I am not a lawyer. Uh, and if, if it wasn't for reaching out to take root justice, I would be closed right now because th there was no business, no income, no customers. We all know this, but apparently some of the real estate people in this city, they never heard of it. So like myself and many of the people who already testified, we were all on the hook to pay this rent. Uh, I am so grateful 
to have a program like Take Root Justice. It doesn't make any sense to take their money away when you say you need us as a small business. You want us to be your neighbors. You want to be able to come in and get a shopping bag or go to the bathroom. Can you hold my dog while I run upstairs? I mean, we do, we are part of your family. So why would you take legal assistance away from the small businesses? You need to extend it. I, I don't, this is a wonderful time to be able to speak to people just on a person to person level. Porque nosotros somos, I say, Dios mío, que vamos a hacer si la gente no los ayuda? You guys are the council, you are the city. We need our small businesses. I see it on the bus, shop locals. Don't take the money away from those organizations that are helping the small businesses. I started in 1975 and I started with a small lawyer and a small accountant. And over the years, all those things just evaporated. My savings were being used to keep the place open. I did not close, I did not go under and they helped me renegotiate a lease that was- Time expired. I thank you very much for hearing me out. And I love everyone who's testified. Thank you. Jesse, thank you. Uh, your passion uh, is heartwarming, my dear friend. And this is not something that the city council wanted. We argued this point last year. They removed the funding. We had to negotiate to put it back in. I'm not sure why city hall does this and why the administration takes this position. The commercial lease program is an important program. There's no reason why it shouldn't even be streamlined, meaning that it should be a permanent line item in the budget. So we don't do this program for the show. Uh, we play with the organizations and obviously those that are impacted when we look at cuts and threats. So thank you, Jesse. Thank you, my dear friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will next be calling on Olympia Kazi to testify. After Olympia Kazi, I will be calling on Leah Archibald and then Ayana. Olympia? Time starts now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, great. I must say it's a tough act to follow, Jesse, but I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a frequent flyer in this committee. Uh, my name is Olympia Kazi. I'm one of the founding members of the New York City Artist Coalition and the Music Workers Alliance. And uh, the New York City Artist Coalition is part of United for Small Business Coalition. And you heard from so many of us. So now you know, and you also said it yourself, commercial is assistance needs to stay, needs to be permanent, needs to be extended and expanded. For instance, right now, nonprofits don't qualify for those services. Let's make sure right away that nonprofits qualify, because this is what I want to talk about. Arts and culture organizations, venues and nonprofits are commercial tenants and are small businesses. And this is the hardest hit sector right now. So, uh, I mean, I hope it doesn't mean that you don't care, Chair John, I, the fact that you just put off your video, but uh, you know, artists are hurting and our spaces are closing forever. And we're gonna need uh, for sure for you and the city council to extend the personal liability guarantee protections. And we are gonna need to make sure that we do have programs like CLA and also continue support for worker cooperative business development initiative. Now, I also serve at the Nightlife Advisory Board, uh, along with Andrew Rigi, who spoke earlier, and Andrew made an appeal to you about the most important concern of a lot of businesses, that is rent, rent, rent. Right now, thanks to the work of many of the people who testified here today, we do have a billion dollars. Half of it is going to be for commercial rent relief and half of it for grants. So please, we want you to unite your voice to uh, you know, the support of this and make sure that the state keeps the, those funds there for small businesses. But there is also something that you and also you can do. And this is give us a hearing for the commercial and stabilization bill in 1796. We've worked on that. The USBNYC coalition has worked on that for two years and it sits on your committee and you can give us a hearing because even if the businesses that we're working with and are surviving, they were hand to mouth before because of how exorbitant the rent increases when the lease were up. And you see Jesse moving his head. That's the reality. We need 
commercial rent stabilization because small businesses cannot plan for their future. So if we want the future for commercial, uh, for you know, small businesses and for commercial tenants, we need to start discussing seriously commercial rent stabilization that also has at the table people like Rachel Z, who is a member of Music Workers Alliance, my group. And we know, we know that there are good small landlords and we want to work along with them, but we do not want to allow the predatory landlords to do what they've done and they've ruined the small businesses so far. So please give us a hearing and thank you for everything that you do. <laughs> Thank you, Olympia, and you did a great job following up after Jesse. That was a, like a left hook and a right hook there. But loud and clear, Olympia, thank you. Thank you. I will next be calling on Leah Archibald to testify. After Leah Archibald, I will be calling on Ayana. Leah? Time starts now. Hi, my name is Leah Archibald, and I'm the executive director of Evergreen. We're the local development corporation that works with businesses in industrial North Brooklyn to help them grow so we can keep working class jobs in our community. Like um, my friend Michaela, who testified earlier, we um, are a recipient of an, an IBSP grant. We're an industrial business services provider. We've been serving this area on a contract like that for almost 40 years since uh, the, the program's original inception. Um, what I'd like to do today, even though I, I submitted written testimony that um, talks at great length about the work we did in the before times, before COVID, and um, what I'd like to do just in, in my oral remarks is to touch on a lot of the work our organization has done to help our local manufacturers during um, this, the whole time of COVID. Um, you know, um, I also would like uh, to request that funding be restored to pre-pre-pandemic levels. And of course, if there's anything in the stimulus package that's targeted at New York City manufacturers, um, it would be so great to be able to get resources out to them because I think if COVID taught us any lessons, it is that a vibrant local industrial sector is important, not just for economic development, but it's an imperative to ensuring public health and welfare. You know, by facilitating an un uninterrupted food supply for the city and demonstrating the ability to produce protective gear for essential workers on short notice, the industrial sector has proven equally crucial in good times and bad. Um, North Brooklyn is home to over 1,200 industrial businesses with over 15,000 employees. The vast majority of these businesses are suffering. Most of them had to suspend operations, um, particularly at the beginning of COVID, and furloughed many of their employees during the shelter in place. Since so much of the manufacturing workforce lives locally, the economic health of these businesses is directly related to the economic health of the local residential community. Um, Evergreen has adjusted the services we've been providing to our businesses since we last sat in the seats in our office on March 13th, 2020. Um, so generally speaking, our COVID related business assistance includes helping businesses apply for direct relief from city, state and federal grant and loan programs, daily crisis communications with the small businesses, um, which is really kind of um, the most important thing. Um, we do, I date, we did used to do a weekly e-blast. We expired. turned it into daily. Okay, and that was key um, for many of our businesses to be able to find out uh, about resources. Um, I will wrap it up with that. Um, informational webinars, research and reporting, um, and aggregating and promoting employment opportunities, and so much more. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. My written testimony goes over in great detail the other things that we've been able to help our manufacturers do. Thanks so much. Thanks, Leah. I'm looking forward to reading your testimony. Grateful to you. Thank you. I will next be calling on Ayana to testify. Ayana? Time starts now. Hello, my name is Ayana Ponce. Um, I'm current, I live in the Bronx, New York, and I'm currently a student at Hunter College. 
Um, actually, I'm actually a part of Caillou Center as a foster care agency. And with them, we have a program called Fair Futures. Um, right now, I'm, I have over 3.0 GPA in college. I'm a second year student. And none of this would be possible without the guidance of my Fair Futures co coach, Ms. Carroll. She helped me a lot with um, looking at colleges, getting into different colleges. And I have many aspirations to become a lawyer and things of that nature. And she's she really helped a lot, especially through COVID. She's been there with my mental mental support. And I think Fair Futures is something that's very, very important to help me through college. And I think that it's something that needs to continue to be, to continue to be funded for many other foster youth that are just like me. And thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Ayana. I'm grateful to you for participating. I encourage you to participate on these hearings. We need, we need to hear more from our uh, teenagers and um, Bronx sites in particular. Grateful to you. Continue doing well in school. You are our future. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who is registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Jonai to offer any closing remarks. Thank you, Noah. And I wanna thank all of you who took the time out to participate in today's hearing and discussions. Your input is extremely valuable. Um, what you help us do is take the issues that you bring to our attentions and your concerns, and we hope to build a better budget from it. So your testimony, a part of this record which will help shape how we end up shaping out the budget. I am grateful to you and I want to thank all of those small business owners uh, that have stuck it through, uh, that have really put on uh, a yeoman show uh, by continuing to fight to survive and to hopefully get through this. I know that we're going to come out stronger on the other end. So today it's all about survival and we'll all thrive later. God bless you all and thank you so much. This will end our hearing on Small Business Committee of the Budget.